Have you heard the news about Alexi's polygraph test? Yeah, it seems she's taken a polygraph test and now her lawyer has notified the court about his intention to use it as evidence in her defense. Can you believe it? You probably already know that polygraph tests are not admissible in most courts in the United States. They are considered unreliable for several key reasons. The primary issue is that they do not actually detect lies. Instead, they monitor various biological responses, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and skin sweat under the assumption that lying triggers specific changes in these areas. In essence, the machine measures nervousness rather than lies. There is no such thing as a lying reaction. The machine records nervousness, and it's the nervous reaction that brands you as a liar. But this is a problem if you consider the scenario where someone naturally tends to be nervous or someone who has a history of being a habitual liar and can remain composed while fabricating stories. Take, for instance, someone like Letitia Stauk, who tended to lie whenever her mouth was open. It's conceivable that she might have successfully deceived a polygraph test if she had ever actually attempted one instead of resorting to purchasing a fake one to try to cover her tracks. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can learn all about Letitia and her horrific crime here in Consciousness of a Killer. So the differences in how each person responds to stress is one critical reason why polygraph tests are so unreliable. People respond differently under pressure. And as a result of these differences, the tests can render both false positives and false negatives. Also, people who understand how these tests work can use techniques to manipulate the results in their favor by actively regulating their physiological responses throughout the test. For example, activities like counting backwards in multiples or attempting to do a difficult math problem during the test can serve as distractions and aid in regulating biological reactions to the test questions. Given these inherent flaws and the potential for unreliable outcomes, the majority of courts typically reject the admission of polygraph test results as evidence. However, some states do permit them in legal proceedings. And you guessed it, New Mexico happens to be one of them. While the judge will ultimately decide whether to allow it in, you should know that New Mexico has the most liberal rules around polygraphs and generally admits them into evidence in the same way as other expert evidence. However, you can be certain that the prosecution will vigorously demonstrate the test's unreliability to the jury and potentially render the results useless. And if the jury comes to believe that the test lacks credibility, it may not significantly impact their decision-making process, if at all. Considering the number of limitations of polygraph tests and the potential side-eye it will get from the jury, one might wonder why Alexi's lawyer would seek to introduce her polygraph results as evidence in her defense. Well, there are a few reasons, I suspect. We're going to get into it, but first be sure to click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on updates to this story, trending topics, and so much more. Now let's get into it. On August 30th, Gary Mitchell submitted a notice of polygraph examination along with a certificate of service to the court. So he indeed plans to use a polygraph test, also known as a lie detector test, in Alexi's defense. Obviously for the purpose of creating doubt in the minds of the jury. That's Gary's job, to poke holes in whatever the prosecution will say about Alexi. But the question is why? Why would Alexi's lawyer want to use such an unreliable bit of evidence? Well, the facts in this case tell a pretty compelling story about Alexi. Her actions, including making statements about her virginity, putting the baby in a twist-tied bag, attempting to conceal the baby, saying that the mess in the bathroom was due to her period, omitting any mention of the baby being in the trash can, and her voluntary statements when she was confronted collectively constitute damning evidence. These actions do not portray her as a particularly sympathetic figure. All these facts, 
have been widely accessible to the public since the body cam footage was released. They leave little room for dispute because we can all personally witness not only what Alexi said, but also her demeanor. It would be challenging to convince prospective jurors to disregard what they see with their own eyes. So Gary has no choice but to minimize or suppress everything we see via the body cam footage, hospital surveillance, and the ER team's interviews, and alternatively make a big deal of the blind spots, the things that elude our view. The bathroom scene. It is within the context of the bathroom that he can craft a narrative tailored to the image he aims to paint, one that elicits sympathy for Alexi. And since the bathroom scene offers the most promising opportunity to cast doubt, it's likely that the questions on the lie detector test will indeed center around the events that took place in there. Gary has been dropping breadcrumbs about this in the media by describing how Alexi brought the baby to the sink and checked for signs of life and attempted to save the child. All things we can't personally verify. Given his desire to portray Alexi sympathetically and his desire to cast doubt on her alleged intentions to murder the baby, it's likely that some of the questions will probe her intentions surrounding the baby's death. These could include questions like, did you possess any motive to harm or kill the baby? Did you plan to harm or kill the baby? Were your actions in the bathroom driven by a desire to save the baby's life? Or did you intentionally cause harm to the baby? These questions are designed to elicit responses that bolster the narrative of her attempting to save the baby rather than having any intention to harm or kill the child. Gary may even delve into her feelings of sorrow or remorse regarding the circumstances surrounding the baby's death. He also alluded to this by saying to the media that Alexi would have been happy to raise a child, that she comes from a big family and that she's a good Catholic girl and she would have been happy to do it. Now, how would he use these results? Well, the low-hanging fruit would be for Gary to use the results of the test to negotiate a plea deal. Gary may be signaling to the court he wants a plea deal for his client. He may use the polygraph results as a negotiating tool with the prosecution. If the results suggest that Alexi didn't intend to kill the baby, Gary may present this as an incentive for the prosecution to consider reducing the charge from first-degree murder, which requires evidence of intent to murder. Intent is tricky to prove because it is generally in the mind of the perpetrator. But things like her personal statements, Google searches, text messages, and witness testimonies can be powerful evidence of intent. And we, the public, remain in the dark as to the strength of the prosecution's case in this regard and their possession of this type of evidence as they are keeping their cards close to the vest. Now, if this case actually makes it to trial, Gary will use the test results to bolster Alexi's credibility in the eyes of the jury. By willingly taking a polygraph test and passing it, he can say, see, she was honest about her intentions in the bathroom. The polygraph test is also a clever strategy to capture a coached version of Alexi's testimony in the record without requiring her to take the stand and face cross-examination. This approach allows the defense to cautiously delve into her intent, all while avoiding the risk of her saying something that could potentially harm her case. By testifying in court, there's a chance that Alexi might unintentionally say something that could shift the focus from the prosecution's case to questions about her own credibility. And let's be clear, from what we've seen so far, Alexi does not seem to effectively embody credibility on her own behalf. She has shown herself to be both evasive and deceptive. We've seen that with our own eyes by how she walked out of that bathroom drying her hands and adjusting her hair like it was a normal trip to the ladies room. Everyone noticed the bloody footprints behind her. She never mirrored their observation of them. She continued to look straight ahead and kept it pushing. 
then said nothing about the baby until she was confronted by the doctor nearly an hour later. It would be a risky move to put her on the stand with all this observable evidence, but a lie detector test can help to establish her credibility without the added risk. And Gary certainly will use this as evidence to argue that Alexi did not commit first-degree murder. And in the event of Alexi's conviction, Gary can leverage the polygraph test results during the sentencing phase of the trial. He will leverage the results to get her a more lenient sentence. If the test demonstrates her genuine remorse, Gary can use this as a compelling argument for a reduced sentence. What do you think about this clever strategy to get Alexi's testimony on record before trial? Do you think it will cause issues for the prosecution? Do you think that the prosecution's case is strong enough to prove first-degree murder? Let's continue the conversation down in the comments below. I'll meet you there.